Today we're going to talk about the nervous system, which we've already talked about briefly with homeostasis. So I want to start by having you look at a picture really quickly. All right, so this picture, you know, we have a boy. It's upside down. So let me just take a moment and flip it over. Oh my gosh, what has happened to this kid's face? Hopefully when you looked at the picture upside down, your what your brain did is it just looked like a picture of a boy smiling, but the picture is upside down. But now we can clearly see that the mouth and the eyes and eyebrows have been reversed. But your brain does these crazy things where it plays tricks on you. Kind of all those optical illusions you've seen or the things where you can read whole paragraphs that are missing key um, letters in it. So that's all really cool. We're not going to get to talk about that too much. Um, if you like that stuff, you should take psychology when you're a junior or a senior. Um, but we're going to talk about overall the structure and function of your nervous system. All right, so your nervous system, what it does is it's helping to monitor and control. Okay, so that's why we call it the control system, right? It takes care of all of the other organ systems and all comes back to those negative feedback loops, maintaining homeostasis. So let's talk about the structure of the nervous system. Our nervous systems, ones we find in all of our tetrapods, four-legged um, animals, is one of cephalization, which means everything is concentrated in the head. So mostly we see animals that have bilateral symmetry, which means we could draw a line kind of right down the middle of this person or this planaria or this squid or even this worm. That's bilateral symmetry. Um, when you have a defined head area, okay, such as here, 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 and here, that's where you have a concentration of the sensory neurons. So if you think about what are our sensory neurons, there are the neurons that are responsible for our vision, so in our eyes, our ears, our mouth, our nose, and then of course you have your skin, which kind of covers everything. But those are our sensory neurons, where most of them are found. And then we have our brain, which of course is a huge collection of nerves or neurons in one area. This flow chart kind of gives you an idea of how the nervous system can be organized. So we have our central nervous system or CNS, which is your brain and spinal cord. And then there's your peripheral nervous system, right? Everything on the outside. So those are all the nerves that run from your brain and from your spinal cord to the rest of your body. Those can be divided up into sensory neurons or afferent and then motor neurons. So sensory neurons are responsible for senses, right? Sending information to the nervous system and then motor neurons are responsible for kind of the movement and effects. So tend to receive signals from the um, central nervous system. Motor neurons can then be divided up into your somatic and your autonomic nervous system. Somatic is all the things that are responsible for voluntary movement, okay? So taking notes right now, um, snapping your fingers, running, all of those things, and then the autonomic nervous system, it's all the stuff you don't think about on a daily basis. Um, and that can be further divided into sympathetic and parasympathetic, which kind of sympathetic's the fight or flight response, like revving you up, and then parasympathetic is getting you to calm back down all related back to homeostasis. So let's start by looking at the central nervous system. So as I mentioned before, central nervous system consists of your brain and your spinal cord. So those really important things. Um, they're so important that they're surrounded by bone. Your brain is surrounded by your skull and then your spinal cord runs between all of the vertebrae. That helps to protect those um, critical parts of your body. They're also insulated by fluids and tissues, the, men the meninges. So if you've heard of meningitis, that's an infection of the meninges around your central nervous system. Um, so very, very important. That's why, you know, a brain injury or a spinal cord injury can be, have so many grand effects. And this is just showing the different regions of the brain. So over here on the left, we have this kind of cartoon diagram of all the different lobes. Your frontal lobe right here is responsible for thinking. Your occipital lobe is where you get, it's responsible for your vision. Parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, 
hearing right near your head, and it's divided up into a left and a right hemisphere. And most of our thoughts happen in this huge area, the cerebrum. Then we have the cerebellum, your spinal cord, the brainstem, kind of in the middle, which we can actually see better over here in this scan. This is sometimes referred to as your lizard brain. It's where all of the things that happen that really keep you alive are right in here. So things like balance, coordination of all of your systems, your autonomic nervous system is functioning here. Hormones being released by your hypothalamus, um, making sure you're breathing, etc. And then the cerebrum, this is where your thoughts happen. So this is kind of what makes you, you. Again, if you like this stuff, you can take anatomy and you can also take psychology. All right, so the peripheral nervous system, right, peripheral on the outside, like your peripheral vision. So these are the nerves that connect the central nervous system to everything else in your body. So as we mentioned before, there's the somatic nervous system, which is the voluntary control of body movements, and then the autonomic nervous system, which are all the parts that are not consciously controlled. And then that can be divided up into sympathetic and parasympathetic. So we talked about that a little bit already. But peripheral nervous system, everything else, so sending messages, um, or receiving messages, sending them to the central nervous system, and then sending them out. And there are specific um, neurons that do that, and we'll get to those in a moment. Before we talk about um, those different sensory and motor neurons, we need to talk kind of a, about a general neuron structure. We looked at this a little bit with cell communication. Um, neurons basically have four parts. They're the dendrites, okay, right here, dendrites. So these are the receptors, the receiving end of the neuron. And they receive chemical information from another neuron, and that starts an electrical signal. It's called an action potential, which can travel, let's switch colors here, down the axon. Okay, so here's our axon. And it's the long part of the neuron. It's, kind of, it's covered with an insulating material that helps that electrical signal um, pass down. And then there's the axon terminal here at the end, and chemicals are released from the axon terminal. So those chemicals that are released are called neurotransmitters. And you talk about different neurotransmitters, I know, in like your health class. And then so those neurotransmitters then are received by dendrites. So we'll put some neurotransmitters over here and that sends a new signal. So remember, there's an electrical signal that travels down the axon. Okay, there's also the soma, the cell body. That's where you have kind of all of our normal cell parts that we think about. One thing I want you to keep in mind when we talk about neurons and how they communicate is that it is electrochemical signals. So what that means is it's both an electrical signal, which is a change really in the um, ion concentration of the cells. We don't have to worry about that right now. Um, and then the chemical signal is the neurotransmitters that are released. So the electrical signal causes neurotransmitters to be released. Those neurotransmitters are then received by the dendrites over here, and that starts a new electrical signal. So as I mentioned before, we have sensory neurons, which send information from sensory receptors, like your eyes, your skin, your nose, your mouth, etc., towards the central nervous system. And then motor neurons send information from the central nervous system to muscles or glands to cause a reaction. Um, then we can also have interneurons, right, inter-between, and those are just helping to connect the sensory and the motor neurons. Okay, a couple examples. If you touch something that's really, really hot, okay, very quick signal is sent from your skin receptors saying, oh my gosh, really, really hot, travels into your central nervous system. So if we follow along over here, right, so our stimulus travels along a sensory neuron into your central nervous system. There might be some sort of interneuron, which here is green, and then a signal passes through electrochemical signaling to a motor neuron, which causes that response. You'd pull your um, finger away. That would be a reflex arc, so that would be something that happens very quickly. Something that might not happen as quickly, say you walk into your house and someone is cooking something for dinner and it smells so good, so that sensory um, neurons from your nose are sending signals to your central nervous system saying, oh my gosh, that food smells so delicious, I can't wait to eat. And then the, a motor neuron from your central nervous system 
goes into your mouth and is going to say, hey, let's release some saliva, some salivary amylase, which talk about the digestive system. Get ready to digest this food, which smells so good. I throw in this picture just because I think it's really cool. It's called a homunculus. Basically, is showing if where the sensory neurons are located in your body in terms of concentration. Um, so we can see, you know, think about where the most sensitive areas on your body are. Hey, your fingertips, your hands, your lips, your tongue, okay, all up in here. Notice that the arms, eh, pretty small legs, pretty small, even the back of your head. There's not a lot of sensory neurons there. So this guy just kind of looks funny, but it's showing where all of those sensory neurons are located. And then just to tie all of this back into the negative feedback loops, which maintain homeostasis, remember your body has that set point, the example of temperature we've talked about. So if the temperature increases, that sends a signal to your nervous system. Your nervous system is the control center and says, okay, we need to lower the body temperature. So you might sweat, blood vessels dilate, and then that cools off your body temperature, sends that signal back to your ner central nervous system saying like, okay, you can shut down what you've been doing, inhibiting, right, negative feedback. We're all good to go. Opposite thing happens if you get really cold, signal to your central nervous system, you start to shiver, generates heat, body heat, sends a signal back saying, shut it down, we're good to go. So your nervous system is really um, managing all of that um, homeostasis.